So good afternoon. So uh, let's uh, continue with our course. So since we have completed statistical mechanics, I think it is a it's the appropriate time for us to start discussing molecular dynamic simulations and to see how we can do some simple simulations, understand the foundations and some fundamental concepts that are involved uh, while running molecular dynamic simulations. We are not going to write any code in order to perform these simulations. We are going to use an existing code called LAMPS in order to do this. So the basic purpose of this module is to teach you how to use LAMPS to some extent and um, uh, show you some simple input scripts uh, with which you can, uh, you will be doing several exercises and that is one way we will be learning how to use LAMPS. Okay. But before doing that, I think we need to, we need a little bit more background on, on what this uh, molecular dynamic simulation software does, not only LAMPS, for that matter anything. So uh, firstly, uh, like we have been talking so far, statistical mechanics expressions where various thermodynamic quantities are given in terms of the position and momenta are, are known, right? And instead of computing the phase averages, we can actually compute time averages in molecular dynamic simulations. So essential steps are solve the equations of motions for a given system of particles, obtain the variation of the positions and the momenta as a function of time, and then use statistical mechanics to actually compute uh, the re required quantity, say some function of t, right? And then you basically average it over time. So the manner in which you do it is given in the following form uh, formula right here. So this this first integral should not be there. It is nothing but 1 by delta t, right? 1 by delta t, limit delta t tends to infinity is what we used to write. That is what I intended to write here, but I think I made a mistake. So that is not right. But instead of averaging it in this particular manner, tell it delta t tends to no, over a long period of time. So t equal to t naught plus delta t, t equal to t naught to t equal to t naught plus delta t for very large delta t is what you are going to integrate. So delta t is not 0, delta t is a very large quantity and um, um, which is what is the process of time averaging so to speak. However, in molecular dynamic simulations what happens is the software is capable of giving you the positions and the momenta of all the particles that are there in the system. So once you know A as a function of P and Q uh, or uh, the positions of the momenta, then you just sum over all the um, uh, of all time for which you have actually printed out the positions and the momenta, add them up and divide by the total number of sample that you have to give you the average value of this particular quantity. So this is how you essentially calculate the time averages of quantities in molecular dynamics simulations. Okay. So um, if you really want to write a molecular dynamic simulations code, then uh, a simulations, uh, a code which actually does molecular dynamic simulations, there are a lot of issues that you have to keep track of. Thankfully, all these things have already been taken care of in uh, these softwares like LAMPS because of which we don't need to do. But it's a good idea to know some of these things before we uh, start doing some simulations. Firstly, it needs to be reasonably fast, right? It should require uh, require a reasonable amount of memory and all these things have to be kept track in the code that you write in various ways. It must permit the use of somewhat larger time steps. So when you are trying to integrate the uh, equations of motion, you are doing so through a numerical means, right? And therefore, you have to specify some time step in order to capture the position and the momenta of the particles uh, for various time. So you should be able to use somewhat reasonably, uh, the, the, the numerical scheme must allow you to use a reasonably large delta t at the same time give you a reasonable amount of accuracy, right? So if you have taken codes in numerical methods, you will you will actually know uh, how these things are actually important, okay? Last but not the least, it must actually satisfy the numerical method that you are using must actually satisfy the various uh, conservation laws. like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum and also be time reversible, right? All our equations of motion are actually time reversible in reality, the classical equations of motion. If you substitute t by del minus t, you should get back uh, the same expression for the uh, movement of the particles. Of course, these things have a mathematical basis and we can talk about them at length in probably a different course. 
but what I want to insist is that the, the algorithms that are actually used in uh, softwares like LAMPS actually make sure that all these things are happening properly. Okay. So, we do not really need to worry about that. You just need to keep them in mind. Okay. So, LAMPS is what we will be using. LAMPS is a very popular uh, molecular dynamic simulation code. Large scale atomic molecular massively parallel simulator is its expansion. Okay, that is what LAMPS stands for and I am sure you all have visited the LAMPS website. So, and uh, there is a detailed documentation that LAMPS has. We will go over some elements of the documentation and then I hope you all have had an opportunity to install some version of LAMPS on your computers um, and uh, we have a detailed installation instructions given in this website right here. And uh, I have checked that some of the codes that I am going to be using now are all going to be working with the most latest stable version of LAMPS which is 7th August 2019. So, you should not have any serious problem there. So, this is the LAMPS website. Okay. Um, there are lots of stuff. One can get overwhelmed with the number of things you can actually find in this website. But the download page is something that is important for us. What I did was you click the LAMPS stable version and click download now and it will give you the most stable version and there are um, uh, if you if you have if you want pre-built executables for your operating system then you can just click on to this and go to the corresponding pre-built executables and uh, compile and have it for your system and then use it for your specific system Windows or Mac or Linux. Okay. I generally prefer to use the uh, download it from the source and then uh, compile it on my computer and generate an executable file for my system. Okay. If you want to know how to do that also you can actually um, go to the uh, manual and in the manual you will find install LAMPS. After downloading, just download an executable for Linux but that is not what we want. I want to source code. So, once you download the source code, you can use what is referred to as um, make, a C make, a combination of C make and make to basically get the executable that is required for your system. It is not required to know all these details for this course, but of course, if you are doing research and you want to install it on a cluster or, uh, so that it functions over uh, many processors, then you might need all that. Okay. For this current purposes, that is not necessary. So, the documentation for LAMPS is pretty useful. So, you can type in specific commands to see how that functions. So, for example, if I say run, it is going to it is going to tell me what the run, it is going to open a page which tells me everything about that particular command. So, the whole problem is that there are so many different commands and unless you know what commands to use, you do not know what to type in here. right? So, the basic purpose of this course is to tell you what options are basically available in the software and what each of these does, right. So, let us go back to our PowerPoint presentation. This is a very detailed installation that you can get. Once you have downloaded the, oh, it is not opening here, so let us not worry about it. In that particular website, you can get a fairly detailed instruction as to how you can um, use CMake and Make combination to actually install LAMPS. This one right here, the one that I am pointing to, okay. Uh, after one of the most important things after you run the software is to basically basically visualize your simulation, right? For visualization purposes also, there are several different softwares available. The one that we are going to use is called as Ovito and it has a lot of different functionalities. It is very easy to use uh, and uh, you can also combine it with Python scripts to write your own um, utilities, for example. So, I would go to the website, click download and choose whatever I want and it so happens that there is a older version and a newer version and I have actually, there is one two, there is a version which was released in 2017 and one version 3.00 hyphen dev, a developer version which is released in 2019. The one that is on my computer right here is the 3. 00, the latest version. 
Um, so uh, please install that so that we have some compatibility between what you are seeing and what I see, what I am seeing, what I am I'm going to see. Okay. VMD Visual Molecular Dynamics is another tool that is used for visualization of these atoms and molecules. However, in this course, I am going to stick to Obito, but if you want, you can actually try that also. That is also pretty good. Okay. So, so LAMPS, what does LAMPS need? So, LAMPS is a, a C++ code, okay, a C++ code and it is going to require some inputs and it is going to do something with the input file that you have given to it and then it is going to spit out some files depending upon what you have asked it to do, right. The ins there are two different kinds of files that can go as input to LAMPS. One is basically, of course, the, uh, the, the sorry, the, there is one input script file and in addition to the input script file, you can have a file which is describing the kind of interactions the various atoms in the system are having, okay, which we will call as the intratomic potential file. And then there is going to be another file which can consist of the positions, the velocities of all the atoms that you want to simulate, okay. Now, the input script can either what it can do is it, the, these two files is intratomic potential file and topology file are generally optional. It depends on the problem that you are trying to solve. It is pro possible to specify the parameters for the intratomic potential and also generate the crystal structure from within the input script itself. You do not need always these intratomic potential files and the topology file. What I am calling topology file is basically the positions of all the atoms. Uh, in the system for a crystalline solid and I am sure uh, your MATLAB code can actually generate that, right. You can either write the MATLAB code and have the input script read the coordinates from that file or you can have uh, commands in the input script which will generate the crystal structure itself, okay. We will see that also, okay. So once you give these two, these, this information to the input uh, to LAMPS, it reads, it understands what to do. And at the end, it is going to print out several files and uh, one file is called as the log file, okay. It can be named differently, but we will call it the log file, which contains thermodynamic information for the entire system, okay, for the entire system, for the, for example, the pressure of the system or the temperature of the system, the stress components of the entire simulation box that you are having, all that will be there in the log file. And you can choose from the input script what you want to print out and what you do not want to print out. Uh, in the log file. Dump file is something that will contain per atom information like for example, atom coordinates as a function of time or atom velocities as a function of time or per atom stresses as a function of time. Okay, What it, what it means is something we will uh, discuss later but per atom stresses or uh, volume of an atom or something like that. Okay, All these quantities you can calculate and print it out into a file called as the dump file and you can choose in the input, input script, the, um, the, the format in which you want these things to be printed out, okay. So we will actually look at all of these things one by one slowly, but overall LAMPS will take, in general, it can take a basic input script, a file which contains information on the interatomic potential and a file that contains information on the topology. So this, the word topology is generally used when we are talking about uh, system like a polymer system where, where in addition to the atom coordinates, you also need to specify how these atoms are actually bonded, okay. So for example, there might be a chain of atoms and all these atoms are bonded together and there might be another chain. This atom on the second chain and the atom on the first chain are not actually bonded. So you can specify all this information in the topology file, okay. For the kind of stuff that we are going to do in class, we are not going to be dealing with polymers, we will generally deal with metals and ceramics and so forth. So for such cases, it is in, in, sufficient if we have the file containing only the positions of all the atoms in the system. Okay. So the general input file structure, this is a good place to start. So how what does the input script, so uh, by now you must have understood that the input script plays a very important role. That is where you uh, are actually telling LAMPS what to do. So the second you know how to write a good input script, uh, you are basically using LAMPS well, right. So 
the input script structure consists of four aspects. One is you initialize the system that means you can basically construct your crystal structure for example, right? define the atom for example, what is the atom's mass, uh, what is the charge on the atom so on and so forth. Okay. Then perform a group of settings, perform a group of settings like if you have any intratomic potential information that you want to give, you can give that okay. and then you basically decide what you want to do with the system and run a simulation. Okay. So, there are several different commands that are there which are associated with each of these categories initialization, uh, atom definition, settings and running a simulation and some of these commands are listed here units, dimension, boundary, atom style are all key words that are used in LAMPS to define certain things. Okay. Similarly, atom definition, okay. lattice, region, create box, create atoms, all these commands or keywords are used to do certain things that is associated with the definition of the structure that you are dealing with. You can also use the other codes that I gave you and have input script read, read from these. Okay. It is not necessary that you always need to use these commands. But in my opinion, as far as possible, you should try to use the commands that are already there built in LAMP so that you do not you don't have to worry about making errors in your the input script that you basically give to LAMPS, right, as far as possible. Pair style, time step, group, pair coefficients, the coefficients of the uh, interatomic potential, all these things will basically perform certain settings and help you run specific kinds of simulations. So, dump for example, is a command that will help you dump out the information like what information you want the information of all the atoms and the velocities of the system then the command is dump. Okay. These all, all these things may seem abstract to somebody who has never uh, done any uh, read, uh, written any input script for LAMPS, but this is just an introduction we are going to see many of these in good detail. Okay. So, <coughs> Before we begin looking at an input script, I think it is important to understand a few of the details concerning, con uh, concerning the interatomic potential. So, the interatomic potential is a very important input that actually goes into any molecular dynamic simulations uh, simulation software. So, what interatomic potential defines is how these atoms are interacting, that is it. The total energy of the system is always equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The, the kinetic energy is easily calculatable, you can calculate it as just half mv square summed over all the atoms in the system, right. However, the potential energy is very complicated, right. It involves analyzing how the energy of the system changes when the atoms are coming close together and going away from each other and these have significant electronic contributions to them because when atoms are, so nucleus is there and then it is surrounded by an electron cloud. So, when the atoms are coming close together, there is going to be a significant repulsion because of the electron, electron, electron uh, cloud repulsion is going to take place. Okay. This force has to be modeled in uh, properly to actually capture the interatomic potential energy accurately. Okay. The other form of energies that is existing between the ions such as say columbic interaction, you already have a model for them q1, q2 by r square is basically a model that captures the electronic interaction, long range interactions that is existing between uh, atoms in a system just because of their charges. However, for this nuclear interactions, we have to develop proper models that captures these systems properly, right? capture the behavior of the systems properly. So, this interatomic potential is extremely crucial for any molecular dynamics software. Okay. So, so, basically there are many different types of potentials, but let us look at one general way of writing the interatomic potential. The interatomic potential is obviously a function of the positions of all the atoms in the system, right? 
Let us look at some of the features of these interatomic potentials before we actually start running any simulation. So, u is a function of r1, r2, r3 and so on, where r1, r2, r3 are all the, the Cartesian positions of the atoms that is there in the system. How is this interatomic potential useful? The derivative of the interatomic potential with respect to the position is actually the force on the atom, right? And once you know the force on the atom, you can use mx double dot is equal to that force and solve this problem numerically to actually calculate the positions and the momenta of all the particles as a function of time. So, this interatomic potential is essential to actually solve the numerical equations. You actually have to take a derivative of the potential with respect to the distance to calculate the force or the position with respect to calculate the force and use that in this equation right here, equation number 4 right here and solve this numerically in order to update your positions with time, right. So, this expression u may be a function of r1, r2, r3. So, what this expression says is the kth component of the force on the alpha atom is nothing but minus dou u by dou r alpha k where alpha is again a label for the atom and k is basically the component okay so this is why this is how the interatomic potential is used in a molecular dynamic simulation software of course you will also comprise of the columbic interactions in case you are talking about a charged system right otherwise it is just the nuclear interactions that is existing between the atoms okay when the atoms don't have they are not when they are not ions okay any doubts so, U is modeled by U is? We are calculating mostly the force. Yes. So, lambs will calculate the force and. Uh, if you have an explicit functional form for U in terms of R, then you just have to take the derivative of U with respect to R to calculate the force. Correct? But there are some, there are some um, complications there. I will, I will come to it in a little bit. Okay. Yes, you are right. So, you have to know explicit functional forms for these potentials. So, what are those functional forms and what can they be functions of is something that we need to look at. Okay. The first thing is, I s delta x. of that atom that means u is a function of say u is a function of the positions of all the atoms then the force you need to calculate the force on the alpha -th atom force means x component of force y component of force and z component of force right so the force is nothing but negative of the derivative of the interatomic potential energy with respect to the position of the, uh, the if you want to calculate fx on the alpha -th atom, it is derivative of the derivative of u with respect to the x coordinate of the alpha -th atom. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, let us uh, look at this. The whole problem is if you have u explicitly as a function of the actual positions of various atoms in the system and it appears that way, that means the functional form is only a function of the actual positions of the atom, then what does it mean? It means that if the body is actually moving rigidly like this or rotating rigidly like this, then the energy changes. That is what it means. If u is a function of the actual position of all the atoms comprising this body, then if this body moves rigidly, either rotates rigidly or moves, displaces rigidly, the value of u changes because r1, r2, r3 are all changing. But should it change? They should not change, right? Therefore, this u, the functional form of u must be such that it is invariant with respect to superposed rigid body motion or translation. It has to be. The second issue is it must also be invariant with respect to the inversion operator. In, in a sense, we also expect that 
if you simply change your coordinate system from uh, x y z to minus x minus y minus z okay then which essentially amounts to saying replacing r1 r2 r3 with minus r1 minus r2 minus r3 the distances between these are the system looks exactly the same and we shouldn't see any change in the potential energy of the system right so these two conditions have to be satisfied by this interatomic potential function u so what happens is mathematically if you try to show under what conditions these two conditions are satisfied it so happens that the potential energy of the system depends only on the distance existing between the atoms okay so therefore i have written down explicitly in equation 6 another potential form v where v is a function of r12 r13 r14 r15 and so on till r1n where r1 3 is basically the distance between atom 1 and atom 3 but not just that it has to be a function of also r21 r22 r23 and so on and r and so on till rn to rn minus 1 it is only dependent upon the distance that is existing between the atoms and not necessarily and not explicitly on the positions of these atoms therefore the interatomic potentials that we will deal with will only have the scalar distance quantity r which is between two different between two different atoms is that okay and that is because of the requirement of the conditions in uh, the two conditions that we just uh, discussed okay so so uh, now it's actually a still a, still it, it still remains a complicated problem because you are talking about the distance between an atom here and an atom there and they are interacting is what you are saying right you are saying that in general you must actually depend on these distances it so happens that the interatomic potential can actually be divided into sums that is shown as follows so v is nothing but v naught okay plus 1 by 2 factorial times sum over only pairs of atoms this at the energy of this atom depends only on uh, the distance between another atom the another atom another atom and so on basically the second term does not account for the fact that the presence of a third atom can actually influence the interaction existing between two other atoms so, therefore the second atom is actually called a two body potential okay the third or a pair potential the third term incorporates the effect of the presence of a third atom on the influence between any two atoms similarly you can actually have the entire entire interatomic potential written down as a sum of several n body potentials okay the last one will be uh, the uh, how the presence of all the other all the atoms is influencing the energy on one atom okay so v not i didn't talk about that is basically the energy of the atoms in isolation which is nothing but if you have n atoms in the system it's n times energy of the free atom so that is basically some sort of a base okay we don't we usually let that go to zero and we are only worried about the other terms that exist in this interatomic potential okay now this problem is still a little bit intractable so how are we going to narrow it down you know we don't use five body potentials and six body potentials very often okay we generally stick with these uh, two body potentials or pair potentials where we say that only interaction between an atom and another atom in terms of its distances actually uh, is important okay so yeah v0 is the energy of an atom in isolation in vacuum if it, if there is something called its energy it's that energy So no, so it may have some energy because of the presence of the the see the the nucleons or the electrons and all these things might give it some energy. You know, zero energy may be there for it. Okay. So due to the subatomic particles themselves. Yes, they may be. It may have some energy. So that is its energy. It's the energy of the free atom. 
if you put put everything together in an ab initio software and calculate the energy of just one atom what is it okay but yeah okay but right now you in md simulations we really don't require that because we always take the derivative of this v with respect to r and that's a constant that goes away so that can be treated as some sort of a base with respect to which we are calculating other energies okay actual form of potentials so there are many different kinds of interatomic potentials that people have used in order to model uh, various systems okay like i mentioned this second term that is existing here where the interatomic potential only depends upon pair interactions right only between the atom and another atom and is not influenced which which is not influenced due to the presence of the third atom is not considered is called as the pair potential and um, so that is one form of interatomic potential so generally what happens is you have to guess how do you how do you build these potentials so you have to guess some sort of a functional form for these interatomic potentials based on some physical intuition okay and when you have some functional form for these interatomic potentials you will come up with you will have certain unknown parameters for example in this case the potential referred to as the buckingham potential has unknown a unknown b unknown c and r is basically the distance between the atoms okay pairs of atoms so you try to fit the values of a b and c so that some property of the material that you are studying can be reproduced so Uh, these properties are either generated through ab initio calculations or through experiments for example the yeah i am truncating it i am not looking at these other terms these higher terms i am i am saying that this is sufficient for me because any other thing doesn't happen the assuming that these these other terms have no influence they are very very small sir but but that is not true for some systems so the first potential that we can what i that i want to talk about so there are many different functional forms for these potentials many different people come up with a large number of functional forms and that can that can be a maybe a, you can we can talk about just that for about you know five six classes right but they are just different functions they are just different functions of r they will have different parameters a b c d and so on and all of these are basically given to you by other people which you can use for that particular material okay so but some aspects of these potentials are important so lenard jones potential uh, is a potential that you are all i think familiar with right so it's again a same potential like the uh, buckingham potential r is basically the distance between the atoms sigma and epsilon are the parameters that you need to fit so that you are able to reproduce some of the material properties lenard jones is generally used for it was used to actually predict the properties of uh, noble gases at extremely low temperatures so basically solid argon so on and so forth it so happens it so happened that the uh, 1 by r power 6 it can be shown that the attractive force is actually uh, in the order of 1 by r power 6 so um, they had that right here and in order to make it look good they just they just know that you know the repulsive part of the potential must be extremely steep much more steeper than the attractive part and therefore just for aesthetic appearance they basically made this 12 there is no more fundamental reason than that for this being a 12 6 potential okay and uh, the second news is the second thing is uh, lenard jones is not two different people it is just one guy okay so uh, there are several different uh, interesting things that will come out so this is just these are just model systems they may not be representing reality in any way okay you have to evaluate your material very carefully before you actually make any conclusions but we will show in some of the exercises that for argon this is pretty good and we can see that pv is equal to rt when we use a potential that we know for argon okay so let's go over this potential carefully so there's a the potential if it is plotted 
it looks like this the black one which I have marked total okay the part which says attractive is the one that is going down which means as I um, take the atom far away take two atoms far away from each other then the attractive uh, forces go like that okay and uh, they go as 1 over r to the power 6 and apparently that can be shown explicitly for noble gases for atoms which have closed shells you can show that then the other part is the one that is extremely steep which is sigma by r 1 by r to the power 12 okay so if you add these two you will get this total energy okay this particular spot at which the energy crosses 0 is the value for which r is equal to sigma that is nothing but sigma r power 12 is equal to sigma by r power 6 for which sigma is equal to r and this value of r okay uh, at which the energy is a minimum is having the value of r equal to 2 to the power 1 by 6 times sigma in this case sigma has been chosen to be 1 but for argon or neon or krypton depending upon the um, material or the um, the noble gas that you are talking about the values of sigma and r vary and it has been determined okay you can find it everywhere we will do some exercises now now the now the question is now how how you can use this potential for other uses for example when we are modeling polymer systems so you have you have a chain of atoms and there is a bond that is existing between two atoms right and there is another chain of atoms and there are many monomers and atoms that are interacted that are bonded here in order to model the interaction between an atom here an atom here which is not bonded where the only interaction is a weak van der Waals forces also people use Leonard Jones type of potential. So, in this manner these interatomic potentials while they have been uh, um, conceived to be used for one specific purpose they have also been uh, used uh, in very uh, creative ways to actually model other systems okay so that's with respect to the leonard jones potential i won't be talking about the form of the, i will be talking about the explicit uh, the, the algebraic form of the potential but uh, we won't be looking at uh, figures of this sort for other potentials uh, unless another it is re really required okay uh, <clears throat> but generally the potential will consist of an attractive part and a repulsive part this is also the same thing except that here you have c by r power 6 and a e x p minus b by r is the repulsive part right it is the same thing right this is the first part is a repulsive part and the second part is basically the attractive part how strong it is how its functional form is it is all left to imagination as long as it satisfies these basic properties you are you can fit any uh, form of the interatomic potential that you want for your system but that is not very easy okay that being said that is not very easy are there any questions uh, very clear absolutely clear very good so now <coughs> the third term that you will often encounter when you are doing molecular dynamic simulation is something called as the cutoff radius have you heard of heard of that term yeah. at least you have used it yeah so when you are talking about the interaction of the effect of the force on atom a due to some other atom say maybe pair interaction okay you know that the distance is so large that it is actually not going to affect at all for example take a look at this figure right here beyond the value of x or r should be r beyond a value of r greater than say 2.2 the potential is basically zero right there is absolutely no effect so it is unlikely that any atom which is greater than 2.5 angstroms or 2.5 units from the current atom that i am sitting on affects the affects this atom is very very small right it is not going to make any difference so why unnecessarily make the computer actually calculate this force you do not need to have the computer calculate this force so what you do you specify a cutoff radius you say that any atom consider only atoms that are surrounding a given 
radius to actually influence the force. I mean, I, I know that only so many atoms are influencing the energy of the current atom that I am sitting on. So, I do not want to consider atoms that are beyond this um, radius and therefore, I truncate the number of uh, truncate the sphere over which I calculate the uh, force on a given atom and all the other atoms are not included in the calculations because of which the computational time is significantly reduced. That is the whole idea of cutoff. So, you have to give be careful about the be careful about giving the cutoff radius. Okay. Um, <coughs> The largest value of the cutoff radius that you can give is actually half the size of the simulation box, especially when you are using periodic boundary conditions. And what is periodic boundary condition? Periodic boundary condition is, this, is the following idea. So, if you are simulating a bunch of atoms and you want to simulate the bulk behavior, okay, then you really do not want free surfaces to exist in your simulation cell. You do not want surfaces which are exposed to vacuum. You want all of them to be interacting with some atom. So, what you do is you enforce a boundary condition referred to as a periodic boundary condition, which essentially means. So, let us take a look at this picture right here. Okay. The central box that is shown here is actually the simulation box in which the atoms are all vibrating, in which you have created your system. Okay. And then when you enforce periodic boundary condition, there is a lot of coding that goes into it, but in LAMPS you just have to give some simple command. Okay. When you enforce periodic boundary condition, what essentially the what essentially LAMPS does is, if an atom is actually leaving the main simulation box, it is equivalent to the same atom entering from the other side. Okay. So, when atom goes out like this, it is equal to some atom coming in like this. So, there is a main simulation box and then there are its periodic images. Okay. While this movement of atoms is somewhat okay to understand, what is more important to understand are the forces that is existing between the atoms. So, let us take a look at this atom alpha right here and this atom beta right here inside the main simulation box and the primed quantities are the corresponding uh, periodic images of the same atom. So, this is a same atom is here, right? same atom is here. Okay. So, when you want to calculate the force that is existing between the two atoms alpha and beta, if you look in the main simulation box, it appears as if they are too far off and hence they will not interact with each other, but that is not actually what is happening. What is happening is this alpha is interacting with its periodic neighbor beta prime and that is the way the force on atom is alpha is actually calculated. Okay. However, for this atom, it is just this because the corresponding atom here is so far off that it is not going to influence at all. So, the manner in which these atoms that are close to the boundary of the box are taken care of is extremely important when you are trying to develop a molecular dynamic simulation software and uh, when you are enforcing periodic boundary conditions, these are the kind of things that LAMPS is actually doing in order to uh, simulate the bulk behavior of the material. Okay. So, this is the main simulation box and you will have some simulation box length and height and width and so on. This is just a 2D image. You can uh, imagine that if you are doing a three dimensional system, then this uh, the actual simulation box is surrounded by 27, 26, including the central one, it is 27. Um, you will surround by 26 periodic images. Okay. So, this is what we will be using. We will be using periodic boundary conditions. You can also use other types of boundary conditions which have been programmed to do various other things like a free boundary condition or a fixed boundary condition and all that.